Pharrell Williams and Louis Vuitton, the era of entertainment stars appointed as creative directors has begun. So Pharrell Williams and Louis Vuitton are getting into bed together. This is exciting news as it is the first time a fully fledged entertainment star takes the helm at one of the most prestigious luxury, luxury brands worldwide as its creative director. While musician Kanye West has already broken ground at sportswear firm Adidas in his role as artistic director of the ever successful Yeezy brand, no luxury conglomerate had had the courage to appoint a celebrity as creative director of one of its crown's jewels. Well, Monsieur Arnaud, eternally the groundbreaker, has reached new ground by doing exactly that at Louis Vuitton with Pharrell Williams. How does this strategy fit into the inverted pyramid structure of a luxury maison? Are celebrities apt at running and maintaining their fashion brands and companies long term? How are luxury brands tying creative directors to themselves exactly via their super secretive contracts? Coming to the point of the inverted pyramid of human resources management. Well, the creator manager tandem is a characteristic of luxury. Succeeding in luxury requires to be both highly creative and imaginative, so this is the right cerebral hemisphere, and highly rigorous, which is the left cerebral hemisphere, actually, right, left. Unlike traditional industry, which are left brain, when it is often initially one person who creates an empire alone, or art, right brain, where it is always an individual, uh, success in luxury is achieved at minimum through a tandem of right brain and left brain skills, with neither dominating the other. Each has its own territory. The partnership formed by Pierre Berger and Yves Saint Laurent is a famous one, such as the association of Tom Ford with Domenico del Sole at Gucci, or the deal between Gabrielle Chanel and the Wartimer brothers. In fact, all luxury brands originate with a couple, or a threesome in the case of Chanel, and the brand can be considered a baby. Not only can success in luxury not be the work of a single person, but it cannot be the work of a single pair either. It is critical to seek to form complementary teams composed of artists who should respect the universe of a brand and take into account economic and practical reality, which is that luxury items must sell, composed of artists, of artisans who manufacture such luxury products and of managers who need to know how to work with artists and have themselves an artistic side, which while remaining very left brain individuals at the same time. And also salespeople are important as part of this complementary team and salespeople are in direct contact with a client. So then they can also feed feedback back to the creative teams. In luxury, other than the creator, the most important people for the brand are the workers, i.e. the artisans who make the products, and the salespeople who have a link with end customers. All the others are really at their service. A luxury house, therefore, functions according to the famous principle of the inverted pyramid, the base, no? except that in this case, it is a real and daily practice and not a vague slogan contracted by the facts. Who would believe that an assembly line worker at Carmaker Renault or a salesperson at L'Oréal is more important than the CEO? Okay, I just want to add um, a pinch of salt here because I think that this comment needs to really be taken with a uh, a pinch of salt. I mean, as I'm sure you know, the salaries of a uh, an artisan at Louis Vuitton is not the salary of Mr. Bernard Arnault, the chairman of Louis Vuitton. I think he's the chairman of LVMH actually, but also or, 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 
or um, uh, Michael Burke, you know, the, uh, the CEO of Louis Vuitton, obviously <laughs> their salaries are completely uh, 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 uncorrelated. And uh, Mr. Michael Burke from uh, the CEO of Louis Vuitton probably makes uh, more than one or two or 3,000 times what the, um, uh, uh, you know, the artisan at Louis Vuitton does. However, it is true, uh, this concept of the inverted pyramid, that really it's actually all these workers and all these salespeople who are generating the business. That's true. Are they compensated via their remuneration according to this principle of the inverted pyramid? I don't think so. But um, uh, some people in the marketing sphere like to uh, refer uh, to the luxury business as this inverted pyramid. So here I'm quoting. So in a house such as Louis Vuitton, a store director has priority over all other departments and always has direct access to the CEO. It is compulsory that any new employee in a managerial position of any kind begins by working in the store in order to understand fully what goes on there and how a manager's job can serve a sales network and thus the client. This period in sales is not only a matter of personal training, as in the case of major successful brands, but really a structural question. The whole organization serves the store in order to serve the client. That in luxury is very important. The client is key and at the forefront of everything they do. I like this concept of uh, luxury brands. Uh, managers should always be traveling to sites in order to create and above all maintain personal links between everyone. So this is one of the reasons why luxury management is difficult. Genuinely assuming the concept of the inverted pyramid is often difficult for managers accustomed to giving orders from behind their desks. Traveling endlessly to the four corners of the world is tiring, not to mention impossible in the midst of a pandemic or war like the COVID-19 outburst or the Russian-Ukrainian conflict. Knowing how to stay in the background is unnatural to the ego of the Western leader. So it's not easy to be um, in luxury management. And yet so many entertainment stars are rising to uh, the challenge as um, creative directors or fashion designers or, or, or founders of fashion or luxury companies. So what's going on here? Why so many celebs are creating fashion brands? In the context of inverted pyramid, it can be difficult to introduce fashion with its star system within luxury house. The rejection may be swift if the teams dealing with fashion do not have the right human behaviors i.e. prioritizing the workers, artisans, and salespeople. Yet, a luxury conglomerate has become very masterful at introducing some showbiz glitz at the top of its brand's inverted pyramids by making several stars from the entertainment sector creative directors of its luxury maison. Yes, you have guessed correctly, I'm referring to French luxury conglomerate, LVMH. After a Virgil Abloh, a trained architect who managed his own successful fashion label, Off-White, in parallel with its Louis Vuitton duties, passed away, Bernard Arnault, founder of LVMH, has made star record producer, rapper, songwriter and singer, Pharrell Williams, the next men's creative director of Louis Vuitton one of the largest, by sales, prestige, and revenues, fashion and leather goods brands from the LVMH portfolio with Christian Dior. Many other stars from the entertainment industry have made the crossover from music and or film to fashion. Most of the time, this is by creating their own fashion label with varying degrees of success. While the Olsen twin sisters Marie-Kate and Ashley Olsen have really hit the nail on the head with a minimalistic, extremely expensive and highly desirable fashion brand, The Row. Beyonce and Rihanna both failed to convince their investors as well as potential clients that their brands Ivy Park and Fenty were attractive propositions. 
So in the case of Beyonce, she partnered up with uh, Philip Green from the founder of the now defunct Topshop brand. And they created a joint venture with Topshop uh, and Philip Green to create um, Ivy Park. But it was a commercial failure. And as far as Rihanna is concerned, she had already successfully developed a um, cosmetics and um, makeup uh, brand, Fenty Beauty, with LVMH, and in particular with Bernard Arnault. And then she tried to expand Fenty into garments and, um, and uh, women's wear. But her style, which is, you know, a really great, fantastic style uh, for her, was deemed to be too singular, you know, and not mainstream enough. And so um, Fenty women's wear basically failed as well. The various reasons for such flops are explained with flair and aplomb by French blogger Crazy Sally. So um, I have written the um, this this week's thought leadership article on and um, published this uh, uh, article on in English on crefovi.com and in French on crefovi.fr. This article uh, contains and sets out a lot of URL links to external sites, such as, for example, Crazy Sally's blog, where you can actually watch her discuss the reasons of uh, commercial flops of Ivy Park and uh, Fenty uh, uh, women's wear. Other brands birthed by celebrities include Victoria Beckham, which continues to report a loss 14 years in the making. And despite hefty external investments poured into it by financial backers at inception, and also Skims, a shapewear brand launched by ex-reality TV sensation Kim Kardashian. I do not give Victoria Beckham another 10 years as I think that its star will fade with that of its eponymous founder, ex-Spice Girls, Victoria Beckham. But hey, it's only me. Um, we'll see what happens with that. But schemes may be onto something more long-term in light of the business acumen and right-brain capabilities of Ms. Kardashian. Indeed, most of his celebs led fashion collections, brands and companies are rare cases and most of the time are founded on fragile structures which do not pass the test of time. Those which were resist will be the most authentic and the best, i.e. striking, offering valuable products which are the outcome of a real collaboration between a star with a vision and a designer who knows how to interpret it. So what about the contracts between luxury brands and creative directors? I think the the main takeaway from these contracts is yeah, it's freelancing, but it's not really free. So most creative directors of French fashion houses are consultants, not employees, and therefore have the right to execute other fashion projects or contracts for other luxury houses. For example, Karl Lagerfeld, the German designer, who viewed himself as a mercenary, was the creative director of both Chanel and LVMH's Fendi, the Italian brand Fendi. French freelancers and consultants who work for fashion and luxury houses are not protected by French labor rules applying to employer-employee relationships, in particular in the areas of paid leave, maternity leave, medical care, and even working time. However, French labor courts are promptly are prompt at requalifying an alleged freelancing relationship into an employment relationship, provided that a subordination link, so a link, a link which shows that the um, designer is uh, subordinated to the employer, so it's characterized by work done under the authority of an employer, which has the power to give orders, directives, guidelines, and to control the performance of such work and may sanction any breach of such performance exists. So if there is a subordination link that can be proved between the alleged freelancer and the fashion company, French courts are quite prompt at requalifying the uh, working relationship as, as, an, as an employment agreement. 
In the UK, which has its fair share of luxury brands as well, of course, Burberry, Alexandra Queen, Vivian Westwood, most creative directors are either freelance workers or sometimes have struck a consultancy or contract arrangement with a brand as self-employed individuals. This way, they can run multiple creative businesses simultaneously, such as Jonathan Anderson, creative director of LVMH Weve and of his eponymous label, G.W. Anderson. However, also in the UK, the type of contract is not determinative of the nature of a relationship. Employment tribunals can look beyond the contractual arrangements to how the relationship operates in practice when deciding whether someone is an employee, a worker, or genuinely self-employed. So both in France and the UK, the courts have uh, some margin actually to re-qualify uh, a, a freelancer or a consultancy agreement into an employment agreement which of course triggers the application of all the, the rules and protections for employees. To get on the good side of a creative directors, luxury brands do not hesitate to roll out the red carpet in terms of financial packages, often incentivizing the art directors via stock options and all minority stakes in the fashion brand. Of course, all these contracts are highly confidential and kept under wraps by the parties, but their content may transpire when art directors cash in on their stock options. With the notable example of Tom Ford, the artistic director of Gucci NV back in the um, 90s, I think, who exercised 1 million stock options in May 2003 and subsequently sold uh, these million shares on the secondary market thus realizing a comfortable capital gain of 25 million euros. So of course, when it's a uh, listed company on the stock market, you can see this sale of shares by the management. And this is how you actually understand what a large part of a remuneration of these uh, artistic directors, creative directors of luxury brands is, uh, is, is composed. Other less bombastic ways to find out about the content of highly confidential fashion brand artistic director contracts are when the parties go to court because of alleged breaches of his contracts. Fashion maverick Eddie Sleeman filed a lawsuit and won against Kering's Saint Laurent, claiming that parent company Kering owed him an additional sum of about 10 million euros in consideration of a minority stake agreed upon in the contract. The French court found that Saint Laurent's ex-creative director was underpaid by as much as 9.3 million euros after taxes for his last year of service, bringing his annual salary, including his ownership share, to more than 10 million euros. It was revealed via the court ruling that during his tenure at Saint Laurent, Sleeman had a contractual clause that guaranteed an after-tax compensation of at least 10 million euros per year, mainly for an agreement to buy shares in the company and then resell them at a higher price. A new way to incentivize creative directors experimented on by LVMH at Louis Vuitton is by offering flexibility in terms of schedule and time commitments. Indeed, Pharrell Williams has been appointed to succeed Virgil Abloh as Louis Vuitton's artistic director for menswear, signing a contract with very particular conditions that allow the rapper to keep running his companies, Jupiter and Human Race, as well as honoring his community commitments, Black Ambition and Team Yellow. The contract sign provides that the artist will devote a third of his working time to his role at Louis Vuitton. However, all this goodness comes 
at a hefty price. First, in terms of non-competition clauses always built into the contract entered into between the luxury brand and the artistic designer. We have this non-compete covenants. The art director promises that upon their separation from the brand, whether by termination, voluntary resignation or otherwise, they will not compete with the former brand for a certain period of time and or within a particular geographic area. Raf Siemens, for example, had to serve a nine months non-compete period between completing his transition from the creative director role of Christian Dior to US high-end brand Calvin Klein in 2016, due to a strict non-competition undertaking with Christian Dior. One year seems to be approximate length of time chosen by most esteemed European brands to appoint a new creative director. For example, Nicolas Gesquier took up his position as women's wear creative director at Louis Vuitton on the 4th of November, 2013, exactly one year and one day after leaving Kering's Balenciaga, while Ricardo Tichy waited just over a year to join Burberry as art director in March, 2018, uh, after leaving LVMH Givenchy in February, 2017. Sometimes things can get a little bit out of hand when the creative director of the bound by a non-competition covenant terminates the current employment agreement with the luxury brand. This is exactly what happened in 2013 when Nicolas Gesquier and Balenciaga separated before the new contract between them was finalized. This matter went to court and through French court documents, it was revealed that the brand paid Nicolas Gesquier 6.6 million euros as compensation for breaking his last work contracts signed in 2010 and 2012. Nicolas Gesquier also walked away with 32 million euros for the purchase of his 10% stake in the company granted to him when the Gucci group bought Balenciaga in 2001. Another important undertaking that creative directors give to their fashion brands is that they permanently assign their rights to the production and associated intellectual property rights to their brand. This is not an automatic transfer of rights and pinning any relationship between freelancers and their clients though. In fact, the default regime in both France and the UK is that the freelance person keeps his or her intellectual property rights in the works created for the client. Therefore, these contracts between art directors and luxury brands always provide for the assignment of all the rights to the production and intellectual property rights from the designer to the luxury house. Even then, things do not always go smoothly as evidenced by yet another legal battle between Edith Sliman and Kering's Saint Laurent. The parties clashed of the rights to the photographs, the pictures, in Saint Laurent's online archive, many of which had been taken by Eddie Sleeman. Hence, the large-scale deletion of the content of Saint Laurent's Instagram account after Eddie Sleeman's successor, Anthony Vaccarello, was announced. And Eddie Sleeman was awarded 618,000 euros after a Paris court ruled parent company Caring unlawfully used his Saint Laurent photographs without consent or appropriate contractual arrangements to this effect in the um, consultancy agreement between Saint Laurent and Edith Sliman. Finally, last but not least, like in the Hollywood all-star system, luxury houses now include moral clauses and reputational clauses in their agreements with their creative directors in a similar manner that they would do with a celebrity's brand ambassadors. 
Adidas learned the lesson the hard way after it decided to unilaterally terminate its relationship with troubled yet supra bankable rapper and Yeezy creative director Kanye West, losing up to 250 million euros to its net income in 2022 as a result of this decision. I suppose that Adidas contract between them and Kanye West did not set out a moral clause or reputational clause, because if it had, they could have sued the ass of Kanye and um, he would have been liable to pay a lot of uh, millions of euros to uh, Adidas. So brands are learning, you know, they're learning and now they're including these moral and reputational clauses in their um, uh, consultancy agreements with, uh, with creative directors who are celebrities and entertainers. So to conclude, we wish good luck to Farrell Williams at Louis Vuitton. While him and his handlers definitely seem to have struck a sweet deal from LVMH Bernard Arno, something tells me that he will sweat blood soon in order to fulfill the high expectations of Monsieur Arno. And Farrell, don't forget, always have your models carry bags on the catwalk, as Mark Jacobs learned the hard way from Monsieur Arnaud when he too was creative director of Louis Vuitton. Everyone, it was a pleasure to see you again and um, um, discuss all these things with you again. I look forward to interacting with yourselves uh, very soon. Bye for now. Bye-bye.